Sure. Well, thanks, everybody. Everybody can hear me okay? That's good? All right. Well, uh, I drove up this morning, or uh, took the train up this morning, and then when I got here, uh, drove into, uh, into town from Trenton, and it was great to, to go by Peyton Hall. Do you all know what Peyton Hall is? Do you guys know what this is? Ah, it's your campus. All right. So uh, Peyton Hall houses the astrophysics department here. And so it was 36 years ago this month that uh, my parents and I came up to uh, check out the campus and specifically uh, Peyton Hall uh, because I really wanted to become an astrophysicist. That was my goal, my dream. Um, well, I ended up being an electrical engineer and then a lawyer and then a lobbyist. So basically all downhill. <laughs> um, so here I am. Um, who knew uh, that uh, astrophysics would somehow turn into uh, lobbying uh, at Amazon all these years? But it is—it's uh, been a, run, a great ride. Nick uh, mentioned the the FAA work, which was a lot of fun, and very gratifying. It's something that—it's uh, uh, probably the one thing I've done in my career that my kids appreciate, uh, and so, because they can continue to play with their devices, uh, take off and landing. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about innovation at Amazon and the way we appre uh, approach things. When I joined the company in 99, 2000 timeframe, uh, we were, well, one of our major lines of business was selling VHS tapes. Um, do you all know what those, those even are? Okay, there's some, a few nods. <laughs> well, that's, that was, uh, that was a, an innovative new uh, service. Um, Amazon began as a pure retailer. Uh, we bought things wholesale, put them in warehouses, and then sold it off at retail. Um, the only novelty is the, o the only way to buy things at Amazon was to do it online, and that was new, uh, or at least relatively so, uh, when we opened our virtual doors in 1995. So 21 years later, um, the company has obviously grown a little bit. Um, a lot more product categories for sure, a lot more lines of business that are quite different than uh, selling books online where we started. Um, but some <coughs> fundamental things have remained unchanged uh, over all those years. Uh, it, Jeff's personality is very much part of uh, the company. And one of those, the aspects of the Princeton experience, the Princeton culture that he instilled in us from day one, um, is the focus on the customer. It really is intensely focused on our customers and in a way that um, has been operationalized internally so that we, uh, we're taught to start with our customer and work backwards from her and make sure that she is getting what she ought to get. And this also is, uh, takes place in you know, how we approach customer service for sure, but also how we innovate at Amazon. And, um, there's actually a technique that we use that's it's kind of crazy, uh, but the technique is to write a press release for what you anticip anticipate announcing in, say, four or five years. So you write the press release for what you want to have be able to say to customers four or five years from now, and then you do all the innovations to get to that point. Um, and it's challenging work for sure, but it's paid off in uh, a number of areas where we, where we believe we are offering our customers a, a pretty good set of services uh, and a lot of uh, cool innovations that sort of went along with them. Um, I want to spend today just describing a few of those innovations and then I want to be able to take your questions. But each of these innovations also has presented novel questions of policy to policymakers. They just haven't seen this before. Um, for you know, what, 100 years, 200 years, we've been dealing with tariffs, for example, on, uh, on timber uh, or on uh, you know, a variety of imp uh, agricultural imports. The issues don't change much from 1850 to 1950 to 2016. They're the same things. Uh, so policymakers know how to deal with them. Uh, but when you get a new set of technologies or services that come online, uh, policymakers can be a little bit um, uh, confused about how to deal with them. They, in the first instance, they often don't understand them, uh, which is understandable, uh, especially among uh, generalists like members of Congress or the European Parliament or the Diet in Japan. They, these folks have all these other issues that they have to concern themselves with, 
Um, and if, if, there's a, if there's a novel issue set for which there's never been a, a regulatory or legislative regime uh, established for it, they have to first, hopefully, learn uh, what the service and technology is, how it works. So I find that a, a big part of my job uh, running public policy globally for, for Amazon is describing how things work uh, and hopefully getting people to understand it. And if, and if you describe things, um, how they work, the policies usually fall out pretty naturally. If you don't know how something works, who knows what the policy is? And it, there are lots of debates about it. But if you really understand what it does, how it works, how it functions as a business or as a technology, then, um, then the policies uh, often just naturally follow. But uh, being back on campus is, again, you know, sort of especially across from EQUAD, where I spent so much of my time, uh, uh, well, some time ago. Uh, so, uh, class of 85, just for disclosure. So, um, and that was back when uh, the degrees awarded uh, from the, uh, the department were called EECS. It was Electrical Engineering Computer Science, that's my degree. Uh, but I, I confess that I had a fair amount of computer science, but certainly not a concentration in it. My concentration was in device physics. And I did my senior thesis in the, uh, the physics department uh, under uh, Professor David Wilkinson, um, you know, a terrific man. Um, and uh, it's for him that the, uh, the, micro, uh, the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe is named. Uh, and this particular probe measures uh, very tiny discrete variations in the three degree background radiation from space, um, giving some large scale structure to uh, the remnant of the Big Bang. Um, it's, it's about 2.7 degrees Kelvin, uh, but the, uh, the, the variations in measurement, I, I want to say it's like one, one ten thousandth of a percent that they're looking for. Very tiny variations, but it does give structure to the, uh, to the early universe. Um, but anyway, back in a, an academic session uh, setting like this, I, I guess I have to be professorial and ask you all a question. Um, you know, Amazon's been around for 21 years, right? And uh, e-commerce is no longer novel and so forth. So give, give me a sense. What, what's your sense of uh, what percentage of, say, consumer retail in the United States um, is e-commerce? What, what percentage do you think? Anybody have a, a guess? 70? 70? Any other guesses? 50? 50? Okay, single digits, less than 10%. And depending on who you believe, it's somewhere between 7.5 and 9.5%, which means that well over 90% of retail commerce, consumer commerce in the United States is still offline. A couple implications there. First of all, it's a, it's a surprise to everyone, including myself. I mean, I, I lived through the dot-com burst and, and well, bubble first and the burst. Uh, I've been blamed for the burst occasionally, but. Uh, the, uh, but the reality is, at the, at the time, in late 99, when I got to Amazon, uh, everybody was projecting it was going to be 30 to 50 percent within five years. And so we were talking about 10 years ago, it was supposed to be something between 30 and 50 percent, and still it aspires to double digits. Consumer, consumer, consumer goods. Yeah, remarkably small. Um, and uh, other countries ha have higher percentages, not, but not a lot. Uh, the UK has the highest, somewhere between 11 and 13 percent. Um, and uh, China has a, a fairly high percentage too, somewhere on the order of 12 or 13 percent. But for a very different reason, it's because the concentration of wealth in China is is within a, a very small segment of their demographics. And those, those uh, folks who have that high concentration of wealth also have um, you know, more access to uh, e-commerce in China. Um, so a lot of headroom for growth here, uh, which presents some really novel challenges uh, both to a company that is trying to innovate, but also to policymakers who are trying to, to adjust to it. How, how do we deal with the, the coming growth that we think is going to happen? Well, so. Uh, Amazon itself, I told you when I started, we were selling books, uh, CDs, certainly not any streaming vi uh, audio uh, or downloads, uh, and VHS tapes. That was essentially the, 
the, the product mix at the time. We now have uh, dozens of different product categories. Um, we uh, famously have extremely thin margins. Uh, sometimes, uh, even two years ago, we posted an annual loss. Um, but there's a reason for that. And it's not because uh, e-commerce is not growing as fast as it, it could be or was expected to be. It's, it's just that we, have our, we need to continually invest on behalf of our customers. And so when there's a lot of top line growth, and there has been, uh, so even straight through the recession years uh, recently, uh, we were growing somewhere between 20 and 40% a year. Um, 20 and 40% a year, that's a ton of growth. Uh, top line. But to keep up with that top line growth, we've had to invest very heavily in infrastructure just to, to meet the growth. Um, and uh, so that's, that's been a challenge for sure. Uh, the revenues last year were $107 billion. The market cap hovers around $250 billion. Uh, something like 300 million customers worldwide. Uh, they, it's defined as uh, active customers. These are people who have made a purchase within the past uh, year. Um, but so it's kind of interesting, but one, one part of the company that hasn't changed, despite the growth both in scope and scale, is this backwards focus on the customer. We start with the customer and work backwards, figure out what they, what they need, uh, what we can innovate for them, and then get to the point of being able to provide that. Um, so let me talk to you about a few of the innovations, some of which, uh, frankly, you're kind of taken for granted at this point. Uh, but really shouldn't be, and we can ask ourselves questions about whether or not they are taken for granted at Amazon but are uh, not being adopted elsewhere, which is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, one of them, um, well actually several of them, started out as being considered sort of crazy ideas. Why would you do this? Uh, the, the first one that comes to mind are customer reviews. Here's a circumstance where we're trying to sell something and we allow people to come onto our property and say bad things about it. So when this was introduced, people were saying, what are you doing this? I mean, you're gonna lose sales. And we do lose sales as a result of negative customer reviews. But the customer trust that it engenders brings customers back to us all the time. And if they choose not to buy an item because of a bad customer review, they, they're, they're not, um, they're not harmed. They, they're not buying something that won't work. And so it's, it's a great disciplining function for, uh, for manufacturers, for example, because if suddenly they're not going to make sales because they have a bad product, they'll have to fix the product. Um, now, so we, we take this for granted now, even though it seemed like a crazy idea at the time, on Amazon. But what about brick and mortar stores? I mean, can you imagine a circumstance where you go and buy, a, I don't know, a sweater at, uh, at Nordstrom, and um, you uh, get it home, and you, the first time it's washed, it starts to pill up or shrink, or the color runs, whatever, and you write out a review saying, this is a really lousy sweater, don't buy it, it's just it's terrible. And you take it into the store, and you put it on the shelf next to the sweaters. Well, you know, how long is that gonna stay there, right? Um, they'll throw it away and they'll continue to sell sweaters that have defects. Um, maybe there's some feedback, you know, at some point where enough complaints come in that next year they won't purchase as many, but are you, are you seriously going to stop selling those sweaters? I don't mean to pick on Nordstrom. Nordstrom's, you know, probably the, the best about high quality merchandise offline. Um, so that's one thing. Um, another innovation that took, well, it had a, we had a hard time explaining it to the investment community was with respect to third-party sellers. Um, very early on, we decided to adopt something called Z Shops, and Z Shops was essentially a corner of our website, a little segregated section where third-party sellers could sell products through our website. Oh, yeah, Wall Street said, "Why? Why are you doing this? Why? Why would you allow competitors of yours to come on your very site and sell stuff?" Well. It turned out not to be that big of a deal because these shops was a flop. Uh, nobody liked it because what you had to do is you had to go search first on the Amazon retail part of the site, and then if you say if you found a I don't know a cooking pot that you wanted to buy, then you had to go to another part of the site to look for it again, and people didn't do it. No one went there, uh, so it was a feature that was essentially ignored. Um, we, then we thought, well, well, why don't we meld them? 
so that uh, a customer coming to look for a particular product that they want to buy and then give them the choice of multiple sellers, including our retail business and third party sellers. Well, once again, people thought that was just insane. Uh, if you think about the, the brick and mortar analog, what if you're selling a bunch of sweaters um, and some guy comes in and says, well, I want to sell sweaters too. You know, let me put mine in right next to yours and I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually sell at a lower price than you in your store. Um, Retail business might not like that much, but customers love it. They love the fact that they have price competition happening right there on the site, right? And uh, they can feel very confident that they're getting the best possible price because there are a variety of sellers on the site. And um, it's been wildly successful. Fully 47% of the units sold through Amazon's website last year were not sold by Amazon. Which is kind of cool. It's, it's been a very, it's a great success. Um, it increase, increases the selection available to consumers, uh, our buyer customers, um, and as well as uh, introduced a new form of customers at Amazon called our sellers. Well, there are two, um, these two innovations, customer reviews and uh, third party sellers, what we call marketplace, uh, also have some policy implications. The first is the reviews themselves. Um, what about fake reviews? What about reviews on the site that pump it up, pump up the, the uh, or promote the, uh, the sale of a particular object? What if they're fake? What, in fact, if they're paid for by, um, by the seller, him or herself, or the company? Um, that's bad information to our customers. It's misleading. It's making them think that the, it's a much better product than it actually is. Um, and we actually, uh, a year ago, we decided to take to court a bunch of um, organizations that held themselves out as the providers of good reviews. Pay us and we'll make sure you get a bunch of good reviews on the products you're trying to sell. We have to maintain the integrity of the review system or it, it, you know, it, it wouldn't be nearly as useful to our customers. And even though these were a small minority of the reviews on the, on the site, we just couldn't uh, abide it. So we, you know, we have sued uh, these companies that uh, provide fake reviews. Um, with respect to third party sellers, there was a question about our privacy policies. If a third party seller sells something through our website, we consummate the transaction. Well, we have to share some information about the buyer with the seller if they're going to be able to, to ship it to them. Uh, for example, that, so we've given them an address. We've we've told somebody else uh, about one of our customer purchases, what they bought, and where they live, uh, which are sensitive pieces of information. And so um, that involved uh, uh, sharing, you know, personal information about our buyers, uh, which is something we're very sensitive to. Um, I had the pri privilege of being one of three people who rewrote our privacy notice in 2000. Uh, I was the least important member of the trio, I assure you. But the, the gist of it was, is as we had added you know, new features and new ideas up to that point, we just kind of balkanized this, uh, this privacy notice. It was very difficult for customers to understand. And uh, this is a, a policy topic that I think you'll find uh, interesting. Um, in our earlier privacy notice up to that point, we had a, a line in there that said something like, uh, we will never sell your information without your consent. Seems like a reasonable thing, right? Um, and then we, in, in the revised notice, we said, uh, Amazon is not in the business of selling customer information. And we deleted that sentence that I mentioned before. Well, people freaked out. They said, wait a minute, you, you, you've taken away this thing. Now you, you're, you're, you've taken away this sentence that said, we'll never sell your information without your consent. Well, they freaked out thinking that we're all of a sudden going to reveal everything. Um, well, it was quite the opposite. We, we, were, we were not saying that it was no longer consent. We were saying we were no longer even going to give ourselves the option of selling. We'll just never do it. And so uh, once that was finally explained, uh, people understood that this was a major improvement, that we weren't even sort of saying that we would ever consider selling stuff. How did a, a company that started out as uh, an online retailer of books end up being the world's largest provider of cloud computing services? I mean, well, how did that happen? Well, it did. Uh, and so Amazon Web Services, our cloud computing business, it. Uh, 
It is by a, uh, several measures uh, a very significant player in the cloud computing space. Um, and it, the reality was we recognized that after about 10 years of operation, we had developed this, you know, this computing, computation, storage ability just to support our retail business that, well, maybe we could make that available to another customer set, call them uh, developers and enterprises. And we did, and 10 years later, it's been quite a success. It's, um, it's a $10 billion business. Uh, which is a faster growth rate than our overall company has been. So 10 years, $10 billion, uh, and uh, growing very rapidly still, it's kind of a big deal. Uh, but one of the novel policy challenges that we face is making that kind of a service. And if, if you don't understand, I bet most of you know what cloud computing is, but just to be clear, what it means is instead of buying hardware and software and paying people to run it, what you do is you use computing as a utility, just you pay for what you need, but you don't have any of the upfront and costs of, of uh, hardware and software, which is basically very inefficiently used. If you have a server in your, your business or your, your department, chances are that server is utilized very little. Uh, maybe, you know, what, a wild guess is somewhere single digit percentages of the time, most of, you know, at night, maybe not used at all. Uh, and during the day, you're, you're just uh, barely using it. Well, it turns out with cloud computing, because you have multiple users using the same equipment all the time, the efficiencies of it are great, much greater. But from a, from a user's perspective, it's so much nicer because instead of an upfront capital expense, it's, a, it's an operational expense. It's CapEx becoming OpEx. And especially for com companies that are like startups or small businesses, why would they have to invest a ton of money in stuff, the hardware and software, right up front before they can even have a single bit of their business when instead they can offload it? Um, the analog is uh, electricity in the, uh, the mid 19th and late 19th centuries. Factories all had their own power generators. If they needed electricity, they had a generator. Um, they all did because there wasn't an electric power grid. Well, this is pretty much the same thing. It's a computing grid. It's available as a utility. But it presents challenges to government users because the government is used to giving money to agencies to buy hardware and software. And so here's, here's a bunch of money. Go spend it. And it turns out that a lot of that spending happens in September, the last month of the fiscal year, coincidentally. Um, but it's it's... It would never said you have an option of buying uh, computing as a service. And so we've had to try to convince uh, governments to, uh, to allow their, uh, their agencies to use cloud computing services rather than uh, uh, buying hardware and software. Um, a couple other ones, that, uh, innovations that come to mind. Uh, one is uh, CreateSpace is a division of Amazon. Basically what it is is print on demand or uh, making DVDs on demand. Um, the notion is this, that th the book business, it turns out to be extremely wasteful. You know, let me explain why. When you, when you go into a, a brick and mortar bookstore, this is not a knock on them, but this is how it, how it works. You, you often see displays. That's, that's probably the most egregious example. You'll see a display of like 40 books stacked up and maybe there's a, a picture of the author or something like that, but these are being featured. Um, but even if there's not that kind of a display use of the books, uh, oftentimes they'll buy 10 copies of a new book or 15 copies to put it on the shelf in the hope that they'll sell. But it turns out when the next books come out, because they have limited shelf space, um, they have to get rid of these books. And so there's a, 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 the, the typical arrangement with publishers is that these books that are, go unsold are returned and pulped. So if you think about it, uh, it, it turns out it's something on the order of 30% of the books sold by the publisher to the, the retail stores are actually then returned and pulped. See, it, environmentally, it's just a disaster, right? You've spent a whole lot of energy and time printing a book, materials, shipping it, storing it, shipping it back, and now it's just for naught. Um, our return rates are super low because we just have unlimited sh shelf space essentially, so we don't have to worry about cycling in. That's just part of the inherent business. But we wanted to take a, a step further. Rather than print any books in advance, why not print them only when they're ordered by a customer? So we have a business whereby our customers can come in and buy a book from us, uh, come to our website, buy a book. The book does not exist. 
it gets printed as a result of that and then sent off to them. That's this uh, create space business. Now, that, that print on demand capability is typically used for the long tail titles. These are not, this is not Harry Potter. Uh, these, are, these are books that maybe only sell 10 copies nationwide per year. You know, there are a lot of books like that. Um, and, uh, but it also calls into question the, the treatment of so-called orphan works. An orphan work, as you may know, is, is a copyrighted work for which the copyright holder cannot be found. The person has died, it, the, the company no longer exists. Um, the work is available, but you, you, don't, you know, don't know where, where it is. Well, we started digitizing uh, millions of books uh, about a decade ago, but we just avoided orphan works because we wanted to make sure we were always working with the copyright holders. Um, other companies took different paths and took different risks with that, but this is a, a case of where it would be nice if, if legislation defined how orphan works are treated um, and, and whether or not um, you, know, you can reduce the risk of, uh, of copyright infringement somehow. Um, the Kindle device is, uh, is it's my favorite device. I, you know, I have every version of it has come out. And I've just uh, pre-ordered Oasis, which was released uh, for pre-order, I guess, yesterday or the day before. Um, and um, these devices are dedicated reading devices. And to the extent we had any uh, access to the web through those, as opposed to the buying and selling of, uh, of e-books, um, it was unclear how certain features of it could meet certain other kinds of standards that people were, were used to for, for web uh, access. And so there's some policy issues around there. Um, two, uh, two other innovations I want to talk to you about. Um, one has to do with the, sort of the messy business of warehousing and distribution. At Amazon, we call it fulfillment, uh, not because we just needed a new name, but because it, it goes beyond simply the distribution of things that our retail business sells. It also involves what third parties may be selling, and then we can take care of some of the, uh, the warehousing business there. The, uh, the big box retailers, I you know, think of a few of them, Walmart, Costco, Target, th those kinds of companies have decades ago perfected the business of uh, warehousing. They're really good at it. They, they figured it out. Uh, what they would get is a pallet load of something in, you know, a big box or stack of some product, and then they would divvy it up to other pallets and load trucks out to go out to their stores. So pallet in, pallet out, uh, and they did it really well. We had a different challenge. We had pallet in little brown box out. And as it turns out, that's a very different kind of an arrangement uh, inside of these, these facilities. You have to, it's a very sophisticated thing uh, to get one little object out. And we don't know when the order is coming in. We really have no idea where the order is coming in. You can predict things much better if, you're, uh, if you've got a retail store because you can keep track of the inventory. Oh, let's, we're getting low on paper towels. Uh, let's tell headquarters that we need more paper towels and they'll ship a, you know, a crate out to us. Um, we don't know when our customers are going to order something. And so uh, we have to kind of take it as it comes. Um, to give you a sense of the scale, the largest you know, brick and mortar uh, superstores probably have something on the order of 100, 150,000 unique items, you know, uh, completely unique items, you know, multiple uh, copies of the same thing, of course. Or, uh, but we have several hundred million, right? So it's, it's a vast difference in scale of the different kinds of items we've got. Um, furthermore, to keep up with capacity, we've got uh, dozens of these fulfillment centers. And the typical one is about, has a footprint on the ground of about 1.1 million square feet. Um, I'm told that that's uh, 24 football fields um, and uh, worth four aircraft carriers. I don't know if that's actually true. We don't have any. Uh, but the, um, the notion is, is that these are enormous facilities. They're full of lots of lots of unique items, and our customers often order a mix of things: a pair of shoes, a cooking pot, uh, a blanket, uh, three books, and you know a dog collar. Okay, 
that's, we need to have that not become four or five boxes. We need to get all those things into one box and very quickly. Um, there's one really cool innovation that sounds bizarre, but it's called random stow. Random stow means that there is not a shelf of one kind, you know, maybe three shelves of one kind of cooking pot. The same cooking pot can be at 30 different locations throughout a fulfillment center. Completely random. Cooking pot, pair of shoes, you know, eyeglass holders, a book, just all together, randomly. It turns out that that's a much more efficient way of meeting a, a multi-purchase uh, by a customer because, because different items are all over the place, the algorithms can figure out where in the fulfillment center the things are kind of clustered closest. Then they can be found and picked and then brought together through a series of conveyor belts into a, a final place where they get boxed up and shipped. Um, Random stow just doesn't sound like an even logical thing at, at first, but it, it, it works much better that way. And of course, it, it challenges us with the algorithms internally and how to how to handle this. Now, um, the uh, back in I think it was the uh, holiday season of 2013, there was a circumstance in which one of our major uh, carrier partners simply couldn't meet the demand that we were putting on the system. The, our packages weren't getting delivered within the time frames that we had promised our customers because the carrier didn't have the capacity to keep up. Well, this set off alarm bells for us because we thought, gosh, we, we, can't, we can't be at a spot where we're relying on third parties who aren't able to keep up. And so about the same time, uh, there was a hearing uh, in Congress, uh, it was a joint Senate House hearing on whether or not the Postal Service should drop Saturday delivery. And the concept was the Postal Service is hurting, maybe you know, consumers can go without mail for the weekend and you know, it'll all be delivered on Monday. Um, and I was asked to testify and you know, what, what did we think about getting rid of Saturday delivery? And I testified that we should add Sunday. Um, and it turns out that we've been able to do it we've reached a special arrangement with the Postal Service that they now deliver Amazon packages on Sunday. Um, so seven days a week, the USPS now can use their uh, infrastructure much more efficiently. But, you know, why would you park a whole fleet of mail trucks for a day? That doesn't make any sense when you've got all that capital invested. Um, and now they're using it. And so it's a great arrangement for our customers particularly, but also um, for allowing us to uh, maintain our customer, our promise. I mean, here, here's the idea: if you if you have two day delivery, we're promising you we're going to get this to, to you in two days. Why should it matter if you ordered it on Thursday or Friday, right? The Friday delivery. Oh, sorry, you have to wait till Monday. It's three day for you if you order it on Friday. That doesn't make sense. And so this has worked out quite nicely um, as a policy matter as well because it helps the, the postal service so much. Um, but I, I will tell you, you know. It's a, little, it's a little scary to think about being close to capacity of the carrier networks when e-commerce is still at less than 10% of consumer retail. If it merely, merely doubled to 20%, is there the capacity to hold it? I mean, so uh, it's been, it was announced not long ago that uh, um, we have some long-term leases on 20-something wide-body cargo jets. That's something that Amazon normally would do. Well, we're, we're going to do what we need to do to make sure that the, the infrastructure is uh, sufficient to handle, um, to handle the, uh, the increased e-commerce that we see. Now, we had a conversation a little bit earlier about the challenges of infrastructure and does e-commerce increase or decrease traffic, for example, on roads. Um, that there's a, you, know, you can look at it a, a number of different ways. Uh, I, I think the, the algorithms used by carriers are far more efficient than individual shoppers going out to, especially if they have to find multiple things. Like, what if you need the cooking pot, the pair of shoes, the book? Well, it, you know, we try to get it in one box and out to you as quickly as possible, um, but that might be three different stores that you have to drive to. It's a fair amount of driving, fair amount of time, and it's you know, sort of on the hope that you'll find it. You might not find it. I mean, all of us have gone shopping before and not found what we were looking for. Um, that certainly happens. Um, but 
uh, we're, we're trying to figure out novel ways to make sure that there's sufficient capacity for uh, deliveries uh, in both sort of input into our system and out. And one of the things we're doing now with the Postal Service is we have uh, attached to our latest generation of fulfillment centers, we have what are called sortation centers, where um, we sort uh, packages for the Postal Service and then truck it out to the field for them so that it doesn't have to go through all their system up front. It is actually distributed far out into the, to their network. Um, in one example of, uh, and I'm about to get to your, your questions, I hope, I hope you have some, but in one example of, um, of starting with the customer and working backwards is the notion of very rapid delivery, right? We, we've always been trying to bring down delivery times. And in fact, I think one of the most telling things uh, about um, customers' trust in us uh, growing over the years is when our peak uh, shopping day is in the fourth quarter. When I joined, the peak day was sometime in early November. <laughs> I keep slipping further and further and further into December, and now we have a lot of people who are ordering stuff on December 24th. Um, and that's a, a sign of the trust and also sort of the, the, the pressure on us to make sure that we can keep up. Um, but that's, that's for, you know, sort of typical goods that you're, you know, you're, you're buying uh, and you want to deliver it quickly. Um, there is another use case, though, where we thought, well, how can we, get, what, if, what if a customer really needs something? Um, You've, you've got a date that night, and you're getting ready. You've just showered, and you realize, oh, my God, I'm out of toothpaste. You know, all right, you've got a choice. Do you hop in the car, drive to the store, buy some toothpaste, and come back, and then not be ready and be late for your date, or you go sans toothpaste? Um, that's something that you really would like to have delivered to you quickly. And we said, well, what if, what if our customers want something in 30 minutes or less? How do we get it to them? car, eh, traffic, uh, motorcycle, maybe, and bicycles. Uh, we use bicycles a lot in China. Why not, you know, for these kind of emergency deliveries? And it turned out that the way to do it is by air. Um, that's the use case that is driving our Amazon Prime Air program, which is drone delivery of, um, of objects up to, uh, up to five pounds. And the, the, the promise that we're, or the goal that we're working towards for this is uh, exactly that, delivery within 30 minutes of an order of objects weighing up to five pounds. It turns out that a very high percentage, well over 80% of the individual items we sell actually are small enough to be delivered that way. Uh, now, you won't get a lawnmower or a you know, dishwasher this way. We do sell both of those things, but uh, a lot of the stuff, like that tube of toothpaste, you can get delivered that quickly. But as you can imagine, that presents a, uh, a host of regulatory challenges. Um, quite obviously, uh, aviation authorities are concerned about maintaining the safety of the airspace. We agree. We certainly don't want to do anything uh, uh, that would endanger it. In fact, quite the opposite. What we're trying to do is increase safety levels. And uh, you know, our contention is that rather than have another automobile, a 2,000-pounder at least, come flying down the street trying to get to you in 30 minutes, why not a drone flying above you? Uh, is a you know a lightweight electrically powered device so we're working closely with aviation authorities here in the u.s but also uh, elsewhere around the world to hopefully bring that uh, uh, reality to us as quickly as possible um, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you probably have some questions about uh, the, the drones um, but before I, I go i mean i'm a, you know i'm a promoter i love amazon i you know it's, it's you know, 16 years uh, but we've made some spectacular failures along the way, too. And I've just told you about a lot of things that people like. Uh, I've been asked, um, you know, is, is Amazon a disruptive company? Well, you know, an innovation is only disruptive if consumers like it and flock to it. An innovation can be just an innovation uh, and does nothing if people don't like it, don't find it valuable. Um, one example recently, unfortunately, is uh, our ill-fated attempt at making a, a new kind of uh, mobile phone. Uh, there were some really cool innovations that went into it that distinguished it from other phones, but it also had some problems. And, you know, uh, at Amazon, we're encouraged to try things, and it's okay if you fail. Uh, 
uh, you know, Jeff has drilled this into our heads that you can't be risk averse and innovate uh, unless you just happen to be lucky. Um, so you must be willing to take failure. I, I mentioned early in this talk about Z shops that we thought that was a great idea. It was an utter failure. Um, we've also made some sort of uh, strategic mistakes um, or, or sort of services mistakes or behavior mistakes. I'm not even sure how to characterize it exactly. Um, there was one time when uh, we were running random price tests of items, and the items that we chose were uh, uh, compact discs. This is, so it goes back a few years. Um, and we were serving up randomly different prices for compact discs to kind of see where the, the right pricing point would be. What, what, what do our customers expect? What, what will they pay? What won't they? Um, and uh, it turned out that, uh, here we are in academia, it turned out that there were some uh, academics, I believe the University of Michigan, who were studying um, price elasticities um, using eBay as the variable and Amazon pricing as the, the control, the constant. <laughs> and then they said, uh, wait a minute, <laughs> this CD's price just changed by a dollar from Amazon. What, what? So then they went down the hall and checked on another computer. Ooh, it's, you know, it's $2 more here. And then one person logged in from a different account and they got a different price. And so everyone assumed, and not unreasonably, that we were using demographic information about our customers to serve them different prices. Oh, that, they, they buy a lot. Their CD's 14 bucks. Oh, they don't buy much yet. Let's make theirs $11. And, and you know, understandably, consumers, our customers, would be outraged if they knew that we were doing this, if we were doing this, but we weren't. Uh, we, these are the random price tests, but it was just stupid. It was really stupid. I, I think, uh, I can't remember Jeff going on Oprah, I think it was, but basically saying this was dumb, 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 and we basically said we will never do this again. Uh, and we uh, refunded all the customers who had paid more than the lowest price and all this kind of stuff. But that was just a stupid thing to do. And so we, we want to be innovative and risk-taking, but also not dumb. And uh, so that's, you know, that's a, it's, a, uh, it's something to keep in mind that, you know, there's a difference between innovating and risk and, the, and being stupid about something. Um, I do want to take your questions. I, um, I want to say that you know I'm really impressed with what you all are doing here with this program. This it feels like um, there's a real need for policymakers to understand technology, especially given the pace of change. Uh, it, you know, it's one thing for you know the UK's Parliament to be grappling with the steam locomotive uh, and uh, you know the displacement of coachmen. You know, that took place over a long period of time, and it was a single innovation in the middle of an age that had not a lot. Uh, but right now, the innovations are coming so fast and furious. And as here in the U.S., our, our Congress isn't doing much of anything. But when they do do things, um, hopefully they're, you know, very well informed. And I, and I do believe that, uh, you know, if policymakers truly understand how things work, both the business and the technology, uh, the, the policy almost is easy to dis discern, to define. Uh, and so you all have a role, it seems to me, in helping to educate policymakers on a particular area of innovation, but it's also an extremely fertile one. I mean, there are obviously innovations in, in medicine and um, in many other fields, but uh, the, uh, the innovations that are occurring in sort of the communications technology and computing space are happening so rapidly that policymakers are just, you know, understandably challenged. Uh, and so your work hopefully will add a, uh, not only a patina, but a, a substantive reality of additional information uh, to help out policymaking, uh, both in the US and worldwide. So with that kind of an introduction, I'd be happy to take any kind of questions. Fire them at me.